Writer Stephen King was exploding in popularity partially due to his many best-selling novels being adapted to film. His first novel, Carrie, was turned into a movie and directed by Brian De Palma. The movie was a major hit for United Artists, grossing over $33 million on a budget of around $1.8. He followed that up with The Shining and the anthology Creepshow, as well as a TV miniseries for Salem's Lot. His works were proving to be so popular, he sold the movie rights to Christine before the novel was even written. Dino De Laurentiis started in the industry as an actor in the 1930s. He quickly moved into production management and then finally to producer in the 1940s. De Laurentiis picked up the rights to Stephen King's The Dead Zone and hired David Cronenberg to direct. De Laurentiis was a fan of King and decided to produce another film based on his work, this time for Firestarter. In 1983, De Laurentiis produced Firestarter in North Carolina because it was a non-union state and they were able to get a lot of cooperation from the local government. It was such a good experience that he decided to build a studio there in Wilmington. Jim Hunt, the governor of North Carolina at the time, offered incentives and loans, which allowed De Laurentiis to buy a local warehouse, which he converted into a studio. In 1984, De Laurentiis founded the North Carolina Film Corporation, with producer Martha Schumacher as president. He also started De Laurentiis Entertainment Group, or DEG, a production company and distribution studio. The studio was built in about four months. It comprised five sound stages office buildings, miniature building shops, costume shops, and even a restaurant. Firestarter did well, and De Laurentiis was really impressed with the young actress, Drew Barrymore. This was the movie she did right after the blockbuster E.T., and the producer was convinced that she was going to be a huge star. Wanting to get the upper hand on other studios, De Laurentiis started buying up the rights to Stephen King properties, mostly short stories from his Night Shift collection. The rights for the stories were originally owned by producer Milton Subotsky at Amicus Pictures. Amicus released numerous horror films like The Vault of Horror, The House That Dripped Blood, and The Abominable Dr. Fibes. King called Subotsky the Hubert Humphreys of horror and expressed that if he was able to make his stories into films, that would be worse than if they were never made at all. He was overjoyed when Subotsky sold the rights to De Laurentiis. Although Sabatsky was able to keep his name listed on the various films that were made as a co-producer. One day King was visiting the set of Firestarter. De Laurentiis asked him if he could write something specifically for Barrymore. He suggested doing something that pertained to the Night Shift stories, which reminded King of something. He had an idea for a story about a young boy who was saved by his pet cat from a monster that lives in his wall. He went home and wrote the story in less than a day with the major change being it was now about a girl. He presented a 15-page idea to De Laurentiis, who loved it. What sold him was the cat. De Laurentiis decided the anthology would be three of the stories from Night Shift, plus this new one, and they would be linked together somehow by the cat. The stories were Quitter's Inc., The Ledge, Sometimes They Come Back, and a new story specifically written for the film, The General. They called the anthology Cat's Eye. None of the Night Shift stories had cats, so King's reaction was that, This man is crazy! Doing this was going to be impossible. There was, as they say, a carrot on a stick. King had entered into this business relationship with De Laurentiis because he really wanted to direct his own movie. Not necessarily that he wanted to direct as a new career, it was just something he wanted to experience. So he went back to the drawing board to try to figure out how to make the impossible possible. After some time, he saw a way for it to be done. King looked back on Creepshow and realized that while Cat's Eye was going to be an anthology, it was going to be more like a regular movie since all the stories would be tied together. At the time, King had just finished writing the novel It, which wasn't published yet. It was inspired by the children's story, Three Billy Goats Gruff. He had been fine-tuning the new story, The General, and decided that the troll from that story was also from the same universe as Pennywise. The troll is that little monster that'll attack you while you sleep. The monster that hides under your bed, or in your closet, or in your walls. De Laurentiis decided to drop Sometimes They Come Back because he felt that there was enough material for it to be its own movie, instead of being part of an anthology. So they now focused on making three stories instead of four. Director Louis Teague went to film school at NYU and then worked as a production manager on a documentary about Woodstock. Wanting to get into narrative film, 
he got his start the way that many others did at the time, by working for Roger Corman. He worked with the likes of Jonathan Demme, Ron Howard, and James Cameron on Corman Productions long before they were household names. Teague moved up the ranks, editing films and doing various production work, until getting the opportunity to do some second unit work. Corman was impressed with his work, so he let him co-direct the film Dirty O'Neill with Leon Capitanos under the pseudonym Howard Freen. Teague continued editing for Corman with movies like Crazy Mama until finally getting the opportunity to direct his first movie, The Lady in Red, in 1979. He followed that up with the animal horror film Alligator in 1980. His next film was a Death Wish-style revenge flick called Fighting Back. The movie was produced by Dino De Laurentiis, and this was the first time they worked together. Teague's next film was an adaptation of Stephen King's novel Cujo. The director came in very late to the production as a replacement for the previous director, two days before they were supposed to start filming. He was a fan of Stephen King and was happy to get the job, especially since Cujo was his favorite novel from the author. However, it was exhausting, and once filming was over, Teague was thinking about taking some time off. The director was a little unhappy with Cujo because he said it was devoid of any humor. It was unrelenting grimness that made it kind of grueling for the audience. He said he was at a point in his career where he didn't want to work just for the sake of working. He wanted a project that would be different and fun to make. De Laurentiis was looking for a director for Cat's Eye, and since he had a working relationship with Teague, as well as seeing the director handle two movies with animals, one of which based on a King novel, he thought he would be right for the job. Teague was looking at a pile of scripts that were offered to him, and they all had animals in them. Everything from Clan of the Cave Bear to Valley of the Horses. He turned them all down. He was tired of being offered nothing but animal movies. However, there was one that stood out from the others, and that was Cat's Eye. On top of the fact that it was from King, he liked that the script was humorous. He called the screenplay a different kind of King story. It was less of a horror film and more of a black comedy. He said it was delightful and would be a nice change of pace from his last few movies. Another reason Teague was excited to work on the film was because it would be the first movie made at the new De La Rena studio. He was also coming in very early, so he would have more time and influence over the story. He said Cat's Eye was the first time he had any preparation on a picture since he started in the industry. The extra time allowed him to work closely with King to adjust the script. He spent about three or four weeks going back and forth with the author, making revisions to the stories. The director took the job, even though he was aware that anthologies typically don't do well at the box office. While working on Cujo, the director learned you had to be very careful with how you portray an animal in danger on film. When audiences see a person in peril, there's a sort of disconnect where we know it's fake. However, when audiences see an animal, it's much harder for many to have that same disconnect. He had to be very careful and thread a thin line so that he wouldn't lose the audience. They had 12 cats on hand to play the general. Animal trainer Carl Miller handled the cats. He also handled the dogs and Cujo. To get them to do what they wanted, they offered them food. The cat would jump on something or run where they needed him to, and they'd reward him with a treat. Problem was, you do that a few times, the cat's no longer hungry and doesn't want to do the trick. So they moved on to the next cat, until he wasn't hungry, and so on. That's why they needed so many cats. They didn't have the budget for expensive post-production effects, so the director wanted to do as many effects as possible in camera. They needed a composer and hired a young up-and-coming one, Alan Silvestri. Silvestri started in the early 70s on small weird films like The Doberman Gang and Let My Puppets Come. He was doing music for shows like Chips and Manimal when he got the job to do the score for Romancing the Stone. Cat's Eye was a big get for him at the time. The budget was originally about $10 million. Three days before filming, De Laurentiis went to the director and told him he needed to take a million dollars off the budget. Teague didn't want to remove anything from the script, so he worked to condense some things in a way that they could shoot for less days. He eliminated some of the shots he planned, which would allow them to do the film for less money. Filming started in mid-1984. They planned to shoot each segment separately, as if they were their own individual movies. Although they shot them out of order, they went with Quitter's Inc., The General, and then The Ledge. The director said each story was about a different fear. Quitter's Inc. was about the fear of addiction and the consequences that it brings. The Ledge was about the fear of heights, 
and the general was about the fear of the monster that lives in the walls or the boogeyman, the fear of the unknown. King actively stuck around while they were filming to work on the screenplay and make adjustments as needed. He said he loved what he had and didn't want anyone else to screw around with it. Most of the film was shot in Wilmington, North Carolina, with exterior parts dressed up to look like New York and New Jersey. However, most of the film was shot inside on sound stages at Dale Arendis' new studio. Some of the only stuff not shot in North Carolina was the Atlantic City footage. They sent a unit out to shoot a scene under the boardwalk and then on the street with the casino in the background. The first segment, Quitter Zinc, is about a guy who goes to a clinic to quit smoking, only to find they have some very unorthodox ways of making sure you quit smoking for good. Teague had heard that actor James Woods was a prima donna, but he got along quite well with him on the production. He said the actor was professional, great to work with, and often very funny. For the evil mafia leader, Dr. Vinnie Donati, they hired Alan King. There was supposed to be a six-foot cigarette with a human face that taunted Woods during the Quitter's Inc. segment, but it was either cut for time or because it was too silly. When the director did the scene at the party, he sent it to the police's every breath you take before they had the rights. De Laurentiis tried to buy the rights to use the song in the movie, but it was insanely expensive. He was able to license the song and hired a band to do a cover, which was significantly cheaper. When the cat jumps, he's not being electrocuted. They're just getting him with short blasts of compressed air. The second segment, The Ledge, is about a guy caught having an affair with the crime boss's wife. The boss makes him an offer. If he can survive making it around the perimeter of his penthouse on this tiny ledge, he'll let him and his wife go free. The director was happy to get Robert Hayes for the segment. Classic actor Ken McMillan played the evil boss, Cressner. The casino exterior was really a street in North Carolina. They hung a bunch of light bulbs from an overhead, and then across the street, they dressed up the building with mylar and light bulbs. When the cat's in the street, the director used a long lens to make it appear the cars were closer than they were. Then when he runs across, it was done all with composites. They shot the cat running across the street, then they filmed the cars crashing, and then matted the two shots together. The two mob guys were played by Mike Starr and Charles Dutton before he went by Charles S. Dutton. Dutton's first scene was taking a car and then parking it. The actor approached the director the night before filming to let him know he didn't know how to drive. So they had to get creative. When the mob guys grab Johnny, we see Dom walk to the car, but then the camera pans away and someone else gets in off screen to drive it off. The next scene where he parks, they put the actor through a crash course in driving, quickly teaching him enough so he could park the car and get out. It still took seven takes. For the shot in the limo that looks through the sunroof, they built a miniature of the casino to give the illusion that they were in Atlantic City. For the skyline behind the building, they took a photo of the Atlantic City skyline, blew it up, and hung it on the wall behind the actors. The ledge was shot on a soundstage about 12 feet off the ground. The rest of the building was a miniature suspended close to the camera. The road was a belt with model cars attached to it, making it look like they're driving along. If you look close, you can see the belt moving. Carl Miller also handled the aggressive pigeons. The final segment, The General, was about a cat who was trying to save a young girl from an evil troll living in her walls. It was what all the bumper segments in the film were building up to. The director was a fan of Candy Clark ever since he saw her in American Graffiti. He hired her to play the cat-hating mother. The troll was designed by Carlo Rimbaldi a year or so after he worked on the mega blockbuster E.T., the face in the costume was controlled via cables where puppeteers could animate its facial movements. Working with the effects team, they had a unique way to do the scenes with the troll. The monster was only supposed to be a few inches high, so instead of filming with miniatures, they did the opposite. They created a bedroom set that was roughly 20 to 30 times the normal size. Then they hired a little person to wear the troll suit. The actor in the suit was about 4 feet tall, but with everything around him being huge, he only appeared to be a few inches tall. While they were still working on the film, the set was entered into the Guinness Book of World's Records for the largest bed ever built and largest pillows. The giant set created a new problem for the shoot, something that didn't happen on regular sets. On a regular shoot, 
if you need to move a piece of furniture, one or two of the crew could do it. With this, if they needed to move something, they had to bring in a forklift. One of the most complicated shots was getting a full-sized cat versus the shrunk-down troll fighting on top of a full-sized Drew Barrymore. All three were shot separately and then composited together. The director wasn't satisfied with the death of the trolls it was written, so a new ending was improvised on set. They rewrote it so the general would knock the troll onto a record player, which would then speed up and send the monster flying into a fan. Frank Welker provided the troll noises. In keeping with the humorous theme of the film, they loaded it with Stephen King nods and references. There's the dog Cujo, Christine, James Woods is watching The Dead Zone. I have no idea what's going on in this damn movie anyway. I don't know who writes this crap. Candy Clark is reading Pet Cemetery, The St. Stephen's School, and King's Casino. The dog they used in the beginning was one of the dogs they used for Cujo. Kressner's flipping through the July 1975 issue of Penthouse. That was where the story The Ledge was first published. At one point, Kressner says, You get the girl, you get the gold watch, you get everything. This was a reference to the 1980 TV movie The Girl, The Gold Watch, and Everything, which starred Robert Hayes. While Stephen King was a big name, De Laurentiis wanted the movie sold as a Drew Barrymore film. Part of the deal was that even though Barrymore was only the lead in the last story, they needed to have her acting throughout the film. This led to her portraying different characters or being shown calling to the cat for help. Principal photography wrapped on August 4th, 1984. When the director's cut was presented to the studio, they didn't like it. There was a prologue in the beginning explaining what was going on, and they thought it was too silly and insisted it be cut. The prologue explained why the cat was trying to get to Drew Barrymore, but they insisted it was too over the top. The story was that the general lived with another family, who had a little girl that looked like Drew Barrymore. One night the troll had broken into the girl's room and stolen her breath, which killed the child. The mother was infuriated believing it was the old wives' tale that cats steal children's breath. The father went crazy and chased the cat around the house with a gun, shooting up the place until the cat was able to escape. It then leads into the beginning that we see in the theatrical cut. The motivation was that the general knew the troll was still out there and needed to get to our girl before it killed again. With the vibe of the movie leaning more in the comedy horror direction, the director felt the opening set the tone right out of the gate and explain things for the audience. Begrudgingly, he cut the segment from the movie. While they were doing post-work on Cat's Eye, production was starting on an adaptation of King's Cycle of the Werewolf, now called Silver Bullet. They were hoping to have Cat's Eye out in the fall, but it was delayed until the spring. This was the seventh King film shot in the past two years. It was also the first King adaptation to get a PG-13 rating. Cat's Eye was released on April 12, 1985. The film did generally well with critics. Roger Ebert gave it three stars, Vincent Canby said it was the best King adaptation since Carrie, and author Neil Gaiman said it was the best King movie so far. The movie did well, making over $13 million domestically, and then making much more on home video. While the director was a little disappointed with the film at the time, he's pleased with it in retrospect. He's revisited it over the years and enjoyed what he was able to make. Teague said that when people talk to him about Cat's Eye, they usually say Quitter's Inc. was their favorite story. He's happy with that because it was also his favorite. Not saying he dislikes the others, just that out of all the stories, it was the one that he felt worked the best. Teague did one more film with De Laurentiis, Collision Course. He also directed Navy Seals, using some of what he learned on Cat's Eye. Ooh, Navy Seals! He said that what they used for Beirut in Navy SEALs was all done with miniatures. On a side note, he also directed the Rucker Hauer movie Wedlock, sometimes known as Deadlock, which is a personal favorite. Right after Cat's Eye, Silvestri did the score for Back to the Future, which greatly propelled his career. He's since become one of the most innovative and well-known composers in Hollywood. King continued working with De Laurentiis, who kept his promise to let King direct one of his own movies. King took his short story Trucks, which was one of the stories from Night Shift that De Laurentiis owned, and turned it into Maximum Overdrive, which is a story for another day. King later took the cat as the hero concept and used it for the movie Sleepwalkers. After a series of flops, DEG went bankrupt in 1989. 
and their back catalog of films was purchased by Carol Co. Screen Gems bought the physical studio location. Even though Collision Course was finished in 1989, because of the DEG bankruptcy, it didn't get released until 1992 when it went straight to video. Cat's Eye is one of my favorite Stephen King movies. It's got humor, heart, and not only is the general adorable, but he's a badass who survives ridiculous odds to save the day. It's a fun and funny movie that encompasses many of the best elements of King's older works. He's able to blend in some very unique ideas and mix in humor without feeling forced or deflating tension. Every story is good in its own way and brings something new each time. Some will like one more than the others, but this is one of those rare anthologies where I think that all the stories are good. Which one is my favorite? I would think that's pretty obvious.